morning, we'll say. Good morning. It's good to see everybody. Um, the, uh, this is the time in the Wilson community for the uh, historic tribute. And with the historic tribute, we endeavor to keep alive at least five generations of the history of an ancestry. And so, this morning's uh, historic tribute allows us to, to take a look into some of the things that were happening with our ancestors and, and our people uh, after the, uh, the emancipation and after the end of the Civil War. Some of the things that was happening with black people in that immediacy after that period of time before um, we got to uh, Reconstruction. But what was going on with some of the lives of, um, of some of the black people? And this morning's uh, historical tribute will focus on the life of one who uh, exemplified the iconic, stereotypic notion of the bad brother. You know, the, uh, the, the bad boy, Hero Brown kind of brother. The kind of brothers that, um, that always kind of established themselves wherever they were and commanded um, a level of respect. Such a man is uh, this morning's uh, focus of the tribute is um, Bass Reeves. And some of you may have heard Bass Reeves. Uh, it was a new name to me. But Bass Reeves is believed to be the historical prototype for the TV character, The Lone Ranger. Mm -hmm. Yes, the Bass Reeves, like I said, he was, he was one of those bad brothers. He was born in slavery in, um, in Arkansas, yeah. but he yeah. was yeah. <laughs> bad brothers come out of Arkansas. Now. <laughs> <laughs> but what is so unique about this brother is that he was, he was, he was, he was seriously a, a a true was a, was a, was a, was a bad brother. This guy was born in slavery, and um, the story. There's a couple of variations of the story, but one story was is that during the the war, the Civil War, his uh, his his owner, a guy named George Reeves, went off to the war and took a bad a bass with him. And once there, Bass used some of the chaos of, of, of war and the preparation for war to make his escape. Now another story is, is that he um, had a confrontation with his, with his owner in, in, in a card game and, and, and just cold cocked it and had to get out of town. And so that's, that's a pretty common story, especially growing up in the South, of uh, these bad brothers having to get out of town uh, because of killing or beating up or seriously uh, badgering some white guy. We like that version better. <laughs> <laughs> but this guy, so after he left, after he left uh, and escaped from, um, uh, from his master, he fled to the Indian Territory. And at that time, the, um, the state of Oklahoma was, was separated uh, uh, by, into two different uh, uh, governing parts. One part was the Oklahoma Territory that came under uh, federal authority. The other part was the Indian Territory, which for the most part was under Indian control, but for the Indians, but for all the other people in, in the Indian Territory, the, the, the whites and, and, and others, um, they still came under a federal mandate. But the Indians couldn't, couldn't do anything with them, so it created a land of a lot of chaos and, and lawlessness. You had um, uh, you had escaped uh, uh, African captives there. You had newcomers of Europeans coming in from the east that was coming in, into that territory and was to be found at that time. You had the Native American people themselves had who, who had ended up there as a part of the Trail of Tears that had been resettled into that area. And uh, according to this, they brought along with them some of their uh, some of their own African captives and other Africans that again that uh, was integrated into that society. They were all um, in this um, Indian territory, and uh, it was very violent. Um, you think we have uh, violence on the streets of Oakland? 
the gun battles in the drive-by and that type of thing. In this particular situation, with that kind of lawlessness, uh, I mean, there was just deaths and killings all the time. The country was wild. That's why they called it the wild, wild west. So as they moved uh, to, so uh, uh, Bass had fled to live amongst the Indians, the Seminoles and the Cherokee, and uh, they accepted him. So while he was there, he learned to, to hunt. He learned to, to track. He learned to, to ride horses. He learned to, uh, to shoot guns. And um, he became very proficient in just about everything that he did. He was uh, considered to be uh, ambidextrous with his, with his hands. He could shoot a gun with great accuracy with, uh, with either hand. He, had won, he won numerous uh, shooting contacts to the, to the extent that uh, uh, the people of the contestant uh, would not allow him to participate because he was just that good a shot. So in a way, he, he, he had this reputation and so finally when the government uh, of the United States, the federal government evolved to a point that, that they wanted to uh, uh, unify Oklahoma and just have one jurisdiction, they, they had to begin it by cleaning up the Indian territory that had really uh, become so lawless. So they had this one, this one guy that was put in charge of uh, setting up a, um, uh, uh, a marshal force and so that's what he did. He went into that area, and um, I think he was authorized to hire something like 200 um, uh, lawmen that would become marshals. And um, and so, guys, uh, they don't you don't find this kind of a sequential detail uh, uh, laying out of his life. But somehow, after after the at the end of the Civil War. He left the Indian Territory, uh, at least the tribe that he was that he was living with at that time, and um, went back into Great Oklahoma, and 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 uh, uh, started a family, acquired some land, uh, he had a he had a ranch, but they said that this was kind of a, a, a tame work for the, for uh, Bass. So when they began to recruit for these marshals, he um, he stepped forward and was hired. But in a way, he went on to become this renowned U.S. Marshal <laughs> as a black man, born a slave, and found and, and then became free and was hired and went out to help clean up the territory. Now he uh, he uh, to his record, they they said he arrested something like uh, three thousand fugitives. That's a big number. And um, some of the um, uh, people that he, that he arrested, uh, one was, uh, was Belle Starr. She was pretty notorious at that time. But the other one was the, um, the, uh, the Brutner brothers. Yeah, the Brutner brothers. <coughs> the Brutner brothers were, were three brothers. And they were these just vicious, uh, uh, you know, uh, ignorant, tobacco chewing, redneck kind of uh, a, a criminal. But you know, they had guns, it's the wild, wild west. They had killed people, they had robbed people, and so they were like wanted for, uh, wanted for murder and robbery, uh, dead or alive. And um, Bass went after them. Went after them single-handedly. And as the story unfolds is that he was riding along and he, uh, uh, he was suddenly, he came around the bend, and suddenly he was confronted by three men holding, holding rifles and shotguns. And he was on his horse. And they forced him to dismount. And um, so, and, and he did. And uh, so they were kind of having fun at the fact that uh, U.S. Marshal was stupid enough to ride right, <laughs> right into their midst. Okay. And so what he did was, uh, he was he was telling them that there was a warrant for their arrest and, uh, and, and offered them the warrant so they could read it for themselves. And at the moment that they were distracted and their eyes were focused on the warrant, he pulled his weapon and dropped two of them and slapped the other one upside the head and disarmed them. <laughs> now, I mean, you think about that, I mean, to walk up with three armed, three armed men. Three armed yeah, criminals. Vicious, 
you know, in, a, in, a, in an environment, in an atmosphere, that kind of violence, and to single-handedly take them on. So that was some of the things that really fed into his reputation as being this uh, tremendous lawman. You know, not to mention the 3,000 that he, that he captured and brought to justice. But he also had the, re he also had the reputation of uh, aligning himself or working with a Native American. You know, because he had lived with them, and he knew that they were, they were great hunters, they were great trackers, and so that was led to part of their success that they were able to to scout this wide open, vast territory and find these criminals and bring them to justice. He would travel with a with a with a small cottage. He had a cook, and um, uh, um, uh, sometimes he would have a posse, or sometimes he would go on his own. And he used he was famous for using his disguises. So he was like innovative. He would implement like gorilla type tactic even at that early time. He couldn't read or write. He um, I'm gonna close, but he was um, he was married and he had a wife and a family of uh, of ten. But he this was, this this uh, comparison with uh, with the with the TV version of the Long Ranger stems from the fact that he did ride with uh, an Indian partner, and that he was a U.S. Marshal and he had a tremendous track record of uh, catching and returning criminals, and he um, would leave silver coins instead of silver bullets. <laughs> he would leave, he would leave silver coins, and he was also known to um, uh, to have at, at different times as a lawman to have ridden a, a, a white or a civil horse. And he was, uh, he was like a lawman for about 30 years. <laughs> he finally, um, he died a free man at the age uh, of about 71. Uh, he's, uh, he has um, uh, uh, statues and pictures of himself. Pass that one around to get a, so you can get an idea of what the brother looked like. There's a lot of brothers that were very big in the wild, wild west. You know, we've come to find out that most of them, uh, of the Pony Express riders were African Americans, and now we're seeing one of their greatest law man. He was more effective than, than Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday and all those people. So, this morning's historical tribute is dedicated to the, the bad brother, the, the, the kind of brother that just didn't take any mass and, uh, and always demanded respect wherever he went. Physically, um, uh, Bass was, uh, was a, he stood about 6'2". He stood about 6'2 and weighed about 180 pounds. So he was kind of tall and lean. But he would have been tall for most men around that time. Yeah, yeah. So he, 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 he demanded and commanded respect. So uh, may the spirit of Bass Reeves rest in peace. And may the spirit of the energy and the courage that he displayed come and be with us today. Okay, and so um, I took most of that information uh, off uh, off of the internet. Um, so if, if you go and if you um, if you search for Bass Reeves, B A S S R E E V E S, you find a lot more information than I covered today. He was quite a, a miraculous guy. And as we shift from the historical tribute, we go immediately to the Get me a sacrifice. <coughs> and we have uh, Sister Julia and Sister Adelia. Sister Adelia. Adelia. I'm going to get that name. <laughs> Sister Adelia. Sister with the offering envelopes to accept your, your badly needed offering. And uh, we have uh, Mama Fania and 
Sister Julia at the offering table. And so as you take a few moments to uh, prepare your, your contribution, this morning's, uh, this morning's inspiration reading is taken from the Lucille, page number 64, the book of Nakishanki, passage number one. Nakishanki says, Serve God that he may protect you. Serve your brothers and sisters that you may enjoy good reputation. Serve a wise person that he or she may serve you. Serve one who serves you. Serve any person so you may benefit from it. And serve your mother and father that you may go forward and prosper. Dr. Shanky continues on. He says, examine every matter that you may understand it. Do not say I am burned, but rather set yourself to become wise. Be gentle and patient. Then your character will be beautiful. It is in the development of character that instruction succeeds. Learn the structure and functioning of the sky. Learn the structure and functioning of the earth. The good fortune of a town is a leader who acts righteously. The good fortune of a temple is a priest. The good fortune of a field is the time it is worth. And the good fortune of a storehouse is the stocking of it. And the good fortune of the wise is their excellent advice. We give thanks for those readings. And um, Black Binder, page number 15, is a copy of the Wosei Community Litany of Sacrifice. We could all stand and find that passage. And um, page number 15, I'm sure some of you probably have that memorized by now, but for those that do not, copies on page 15 is the Black Binder. As, um, Save us, O Holy One, that we may vindicate us by your might. Hear my prayer, divine protector. Listen to the words of my mouth. How can we repay the Holy One for the gifts that have been given to us? We will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the God of our ancestors. We will fulfill our vows of eternal care in the presence of all our Gladly we bring our sacrifices to you, and we will praise your name, O one and rock, for it is good. Emoja, unity. We shall strive to maintain unity in family, community, nation, and race. We shall forgive self determination, and we shall find our identity and create and speak for ourselves. Jima, collective work and responsibility. We shall build and maintain our community together. Our brothers and sisters' problems shall be ours to solve together. Nia, purpose. We shall make our collective vocation the building and development of our community and the restoration of our people to our traditional places. Together, be mine. Faith. We shall believe with all our hearts in our Creator, our people, and the righteousness and victory of our struggle. The candles of the Lugo Saba burning brightly. Kneeling pads have been laid at the front of the altar for those that wish to come forward for a moment of prayer. Sister Connie continues to play on the piano. The rest of you, uh, you may assume uh, you may assume a comfortable position at your chair. I'll take a few moments to bless these these contributions. We give thanks for this place called Wosel. We give thanks for another 
day, another opportunity to rise, to praise your name, to recall worthy ancestors, and to call for their spirit and support. Lord God, we thank you for these contributions. We thank you for each and every one that came out this morning, each and every one that gave. And we ask that you send blessings right now, Lord God. Send each and every one of their most fervent needs. Say that right now, Lord God. Bless our brothers and sisters throughout the Wilson community, those that are traveling, those that are not here, that are involved in and other activities, we pray for their, their protection and that you return them here safely to the Wilson community again. We ask blessings upon our brothers and sisters in Sacramento as they gather in song and praise of you, O Holy One, and remembrance of the ancestors. We pray and ask for their deliverance as well. We pray and ask for their stability for their success, for their growth, for their continuation. Be with us, O Holy One, as we move forward into the service. We ask that you bless the one that will come with the message, that will come with the word. We ask that each and every one open their hearts and minds to receive the word. Through the word that we may broaden and grow understanding and through understanding we may be better practitioners of the way. Help us, O Holy One. We come asking these things not in vain, but in the remembrance of ancestors, great ancestors, that left us a great footprint. And we're able to, through them, see the great work that you have done with them. And through them, we have hope for redemption, redemption, we have hope for aspirations of greater things. And so it is in this spirit of holy mind that we come beseeching and asking and expecting that support. Be with us, O Holy One. Ashe, Starting with, it was powerful. 
because starting with a representative from the Emmett Till oh. Foundation, right, right, right. Mm -hmm. he was there representing a family member who couldn't come from Emmett Till, yeah. 1955. Yeah. Um, Jordan Davis's father, the young man who was killed in Jacksonville, Florida, yeah. sitting in his car listening to music with his yeah. friends was there. Powerful, what he had to say. Um, and one of the things he said to us, he said, we, he said, the revolution is coming. And he said, but it's got to start with the revolution of the mind. And I would have added revolution of the spirit, yeah. revolution of the heart. And we're part of that, right? Yeah, yeah, we yeah. had uh, Uncle C uh, Uncle Bobby, uh, Cecil Johnson, who was Oscar Grant's uncle, was there. He was one of the organizers. There were uh, family members from a young man in Houston who uh, was killed. Somebody else from Florida. But the fact that our community, including Dr. Nobles and Vera, Drs. Nobles, Vera and Wade, uh, were there as part of this event. The black psychologists were there because they said there's so much trauma in our yeah. community that yeah. we need to deal with. Yeah. And yeah. we were able to add our piece in terms of where is the spiritual work that's got to happen in our community. Mm -hmm. So it's important when we, we're able to move around in those events. Second thing I want to say is it's always, always powerful and good to have our brother, our teacher, Mr. Michaelisi in the house. Uh, <laughs> There was a definition for solid as a rock. This teacher would be right there. Oh, yeah. He's been steady. Ever since I've known him, I had never seen his brother really waver. And if he wavers, he must do it in his own head. And Sister Mary hears about it or something. But, but we never we never see it. Uh, he and his wife have been married for 50, 52 wow. years. Uh, he relocated to Middle Virginia, and he's trying to, to make a difference out there. And that's why I know that's like pushing a rock up a hill uh, in terms of the cultural community out there, because he was a Republican, Bible Belt man. And, uh, but he's here, and I know he, he comes periodically to check in with his family and particularly with his mom, uh, who we're always keeping in prayer. Uh, you may know this, but she came to an event, uh, even on the day event, two months ago. It was like end of the year, summer program. Your mom was here, so your presence was, you were all up in it, your house. And then uh, lastly, before she comes, um, I just have to acknowledge uh, Minister Training, Tracy Brash. Absolutely. Because Tracy T. She is a phenomenally talented person. That's right. Calm and thrown. It's like if you're playing, you know, if you ever play cards, poker, big whiz, whatever, you know, like you all in. Yeah. She all in. She all in. Oh. And yesterday, okay. the women of Wose, the WOW group, WOW WOW, yeah. Um, I love that name because you know in synagogue the word when people want to put extra on something they wow, say wow 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 wow, <laughs> wow, wow, wow. <laughs> and uh, she helped organize that event she helped organize the women in our community it was beautiful come here they had a, a clothing swap and our only critique I had was they had like all these tables of clothes and shoes right. and stuff and they had a men's chair <laughs> <laughs> it was like they had men's clothes on a chair <laughs> it wasn't a whole lot for us to, but many of us came to support right. And, uh, and it was beautiful to see. Uh, Sister Tracy's an artist, she's a photographer, does amazing work there. Uh, she's been a, a big staunch supporter of Ileona Day. She's the, our uh, Commissioner for Spiritual Life and Assistance. And she's a medicine trainer and is growing and developing her yeah. skills every day yeah. on behalf of our people. And so okay. I just want to welcome uh, medicine trainer Tracy Brown. Yeah. Yeah. to the Orishas, to the ancestors, for everything they have given me, for giving me the opportunity to stand up in front of the community now, and for giving me the tough love that I needed to learn the lessons that I've learned to help me develop the message for today. And know that I am not yet an expert, but I'm working towards it. I so I say thanks to this community that is here supporting me on this. I humbly offer this message to you today. So, first and foremost, I want to acknowledge once again, as uh, Bobby Greg did, Minister Michaelisi. It seems like every time I give the message, he happens to be in town. I'm like, are you checking on me? <laughs> <laughs> are you checking on me? Oh, good gravy, Marie. So I know I got to be on my P's and Q's. <laughs> 
Right. right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So my topic for today is sacred anger as a master teacher. Isn't it funny how some little thing can irritate you? For me, it's when people stand too close to the baggage claim thing at the airport. <laughs> and even though their bags ain't nowhere in sight, I'm like, get out the way! You know? And then my bag come around, I got to go chase the bag. And you know, I don't be wearing easy spirits, so, you know, my shoes look like a pump and feel like a pump. Right? So I got to go chase my bag halfway around the conveyor belt just because somebody want to stand right on the doggone thing. And then sometimes they'll have like a two and a three year old. You know them kids can't help with the bags. Get them out the way. <laughs> or uh, Mama Rose was trying to remember this thing that's also one of my pet peeves yesterday is when people touch the, my food with their hands in front of me. I cannot stand that. If there's a bowl of rolls and you serving the food and you grab one and put it on my plate, it just makes me want to toss the plate down and be like, I don't even want the food. <laughs> I just can't, I feel like touching other people's food is so hand, so rude, or, or people licking their fingers when they cutting cake. You know, you just like, oh, you got to, oh, you got to do that. Oh, now we want no cake. You messed up cake for me. <laughs> right. <laughs> or more serious things like backbiting. Right? That's very irritating. <laughs> Not just when somebody is speaking against you and then they come grin and smile in your face, but when they are speaking against other people, it's like, why are you doing that? You spreading, it's spread and causing nasty energy in the community. Why are you doing that? And it's interesting that these things might sound very little, but they're connected with greater themes. So the whole baggage claim thing, it's not just about the baggage. It's not just about me having to run in my pumps or make whoever's picking me up from the airport do 20 revolutions around the airport because you know we don't pay for parking. <laughs> right? It's about being aware of your space and how you and what you are doing is affecting the people around you. Right? So, so the irritation and anger that I feel around that phenomenon is really connected to um, a, a greater understanding of our need to be aware of how we're affecting other people. Hmm? So when we think about anger, what is anger? The definition that the American Psychological Association offers, which you know we, we got our body for what it is, but um, they do some good work. Um, anger is defined as an emotional, an emotion characterized by antagonism towards someone or something you feel has deliberately done you wrong. Anger can be a good thing, honestly. Sometimes it can motivate you to express negative feelings. If something happens and you were bothered by it, that anger energy can motivate you to express how you feel about it. It can also motivate you to find solutions to problems. Because anger does not feel good. If you in your right mind and your right spirit, anger does not feel good. And you want to dissipate that feeling and you try to figure out well, what is it that's driving me to this feeling, driving me to this place. Excessive anger can cause problems. Increased blood pressure and other physical changes associated with anger make it very difficult to think straight and threaten to harm your physical and mental health. That being said, anger is a pretty natural reaction. It's when anger gets to be out of control when the problem arises. So everything in moderation. We study ma'at. We understand that there's not balance that is necessary in everything. Anger can also be an indication of wrongdoing. Sometimes anger is not a passionate feeling. It's a, hmm, something about that doesn't feel right. It happens, you know, maybe your feeling isn't vehement, it's not necessarily super strong, but there's something gnawing at you saying, hmm, something about that is not right. You might get irritated about it later after you've thought about it for a while. It's because the universe is saying there's something wrong. And the Hosea, and you should have a Hosea near you somewhere. There is a passage in the Book of Sacred Praises, Praise and Praises, on page 17. I'll give you a second to turn to it. Passage number two on page 17. And it's in the middle of the page, passage number two. Okay, where Nebra says, though the servant be inclined to make mistakes, the Lord is inclined to be merciful. Mm -hmm. The Lord of thieves does not spend a whole day in anger, 
He is angry for but a moment, and none of it remains behind. The wind turns for us in his mercy, and Amara comes back upon the breeze. May your spirit be always kind. May you always forgive. And may what has once been turned away not come back to us. So that thing that has been turned away in this instance is that anger and that, that irritation, right? May we just let it go. Sometimes we got to let it go. Doesn't mean we got to forgive. Trust and believe. We talked about that in 2000 seasons, right? We need to understand that sometimes we, 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 need to, we need to always learn lessons from the things we're experiencing. But so it's not saying forget, it's saying forget. But learn the lesson. Learn the lesson. In this passage, the, it states that the Lord gets angry but mitigates it. Right? We often try to suppress anger or act like we so pious we don't get angry. We're so spiritually superior that things just don't even bother us. Child, please. Anger is natural. Okay? Anger is natural. It can be a powerful learning tool if we are present. If we are present and conscious enough to listen. Whether it is us getting angry at somebody or somebody else getting angry at us. If we are conscious enough to appreciate the experience. That's the point. How many of us wish we had to pay better attention in school or when, when the wise were teaching us? I wish I had to learn my granny biscuit recipe. <laughs> I wish I had to learn how to make catfish stew from my, from my aunt, right? <laughs> I wish I hadn't done that. How many of us, by show of hands, wish we had to pay more attention when, when something was being taught to us? Well, guess what? I got good news for you. School is still in session. School is as long as there's breath in your body. School is still in session. We get a do-over on paying attention. Okay? And you don't need Ilania to fix your life. Fix it yourself. Fix it yourself. And work with God to do it. Directly with God to do it. Contrary to popular belief, you work directly with God to do what you need to do, know what you need to know, and have what you're supposed to have. An important part, an important first step of this is getting grounded. When anger arises, we have to calm down inside sometimes. We know what that anger feels like. We know when it's coming. We can see it coming down the road. Right? It's like I can name that tune in one note. That's my name. <laughs> it's coming. You know that shit? I'm always amazed by that. Like, wow. One yeah. note. This means not just controlling your outward behavior, but also controlling your internal responses. Taking steps to lower your heart rate. Calm yourself down and let the feelings subside. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. you need to do that. And later, when we evaluate our anger, really honestly evaluate our feelings. Reactions and their origin, they, our, their reactions and their origins can give us valuable information about that which drives us, about our own personal sense of values, and also that which we need to work on. Eventually, we hope that this process will get shorter and shorter, right? As we yes. practice, practice makes perfect. Okay. Practice makes better, better. right? Yeah. Practice makes good. Okay. We hope that this process gets short, shorter and shorter. After re we react not to the situation in front of us, but to a previous experience. So maybe we've had something happen to us in the past. We've experienced something in the past. And remember, life is everlasting. So maybe you experienced something in a past life. And it resonated with you. Somehow, some sort of bell was rung within you. And you react to a previous situation, not exactly the one that you in. Now the interesting thing about that is that concepts can be applied to both negative and positive. So we can we proactively act in certain ways that we've learned to act. Yes. Whether it's walking, we figured that out through practice. Whether it is baking a cake, we know that if you're using a gas oven, you gotta make different allowances than when you're using electric. Mm -hmm. We learn that typically through experience. Even if somebody told us, we, we really figured it out after we experienced it. Mm -hmm. 
And so when we think about our reactions, the prefix, <coughs> prefix re means again. Yes. Yeah. So how are we acting again in response to the thing that we've already experienced previously? Mm -hmm. How are we going to act? when it comes up again, regardless of how you acted previously. Again, your life class is in session. You have another opportunity to do well on the test based on all of the hands-on study and training you received previously. You've been studying for years. That's a blessing. All right, keep it. You've had five, 10, 30, 40, 60 years to practice. Hopefully, you've been studying the right thing. Now you know that song, Good Times, Good Times. <laughs> oh, These yes. are the good times. Do you know for years, I thought they were saying, are you gay or blind? <laughs> for years. <laughs> I thought they were saying, if you're gay or if you're blind, don't worry about it. Just come to the party and have a good time. <laughs> state of mind. Now, I only found that out when I was singing the song in the car with some friends. It came on the radio. And it was like, gang of blind, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I explained to them my logic. But the fact of the matter is, all those years, as much as I loved that song, as many times as I heard it, I kept practicing the wrong lyrics. <laughs> I kept practicing the wrong lyrics. And I needed self-mastery to bring forth appropriate actions in the future. So my friends told me that those were not the lyrics, and I was like, all right, now I sing a different tune. Come on now. Now I sing a different tune. So typically we have to give, or not typically, when we act, we have to give the best response that we are able to give, right? We have to be responsible. We have to give the best response we're able to give. And typically, only we, only we can know what our actions or our reactions are connected to. Yeah. But we have to be honest with ourselves yeah. to be able to get to the bottom of that. Sometimes we have the good fortune of having a really good friend who loves us, who has been on the journey with us for a little while and is clear enough and honest and, and brave enough to be honest with us and say, okay, you know what this is about, right? Girl, you know now, this ain't just about Thursdays and Pop Tarts. This is about something else, mm -hmm. right? This ain't just about the baggage claim and somebody touching all the chicken. This is <laughs> about something else. Typically though, we don't realize whatever it's about at the time. And the connection doesn't come to us easily. So we have to do what Howard Thurman, the sacred ancestor Howard Thurman calls centering down. Mm -hmm. We turn to the silence of our mind and open our hearts to hear and gain understanding from the universe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sometimes we have to get out into nature. Right? Sometimes we simply need to walk the lake or head to Roberts Park or even take a drive all the way out to Muir Woods sometimes. Right? If we really want to change things. Being in nature and listening to the rhythms of nature mm -hmm. helps us to pay attention to the lesson of the lessons of the ancestors and the natural. We see many metaphorical examples of whatever it is we're going through. One of my many mentors and a good friend of mine, Terry Lang, who is a minister in San Francisco, he told me once, when you are going through an experience of growth, the rocks will speak to you. Mm -hmm. Everything will speak out to you. You will find meaning and understanding. It also reminds me of the story of Heru and Set. And there are many iterations of that story. But the moral of the story is essentially an understanding of how the higher self and the chaotic uh, potential of the universe come together and work together. That, it, it's beautiful because the ancestors said that my balance was central to all. And how true is that? Every single story, every single lesson, every single phenomenon in our lives, my, my balance is at the heart and soul of them. When we take the lessons that the universe hands us through, through things like anger, 
and use our accumulated knowledge to fully appreciate the lesson. That's growth. When we use all that knowledge that we stored up, that we gathered up throughout the years to do better in support of our, us on our journey. That's growth. We learn how to respond when a similar situation arises. And how many of us know a, situ a similar situation is going to continue to arise until you learn the lesson? And even after, the interesting thing is you pay a different kind of attention to it. Why? Because you have practiced and you have gained some level of mastery around it. You've gained some level of mastery around it. We thank God. And also send a special shout out to Seth. Seth is the nature of chaos and confusion. We give thanks to the Most High for its brilliance in designing a universe, intentionally designing a universe and a system that teaches us through the good and the bad. It's not always an easy pill to swallow. Sometimes it's candy coated and sometimes you have to drink a lot of water. <laughs> you have to drink a lot of water to get that one down and it's bitter and it's harsh and it's hard and it's tough, but we swallow it mm -hmm. and we carry on to tell the tale and take more pills. <laughs> Now, when we think about Set's role, that's why Set is a nature. It baffled me when I first heard or realized that. It took me a minute to fully appreciate the fact that Set is a nature because Set, in his mastery of chaos and confusion, has a sacred role in bringing out balance, bringing about balance in the universe. Right. In libation, we say, I bless you, but I bind you so that we cannot move. We're not trying to triple, uh, cripple Seth because Seth has a job to do. And Seth is just doing his job. Seth is just doing his job. And we have to do our jobs in learning the lessons that we need to learn so that we can navigate those experiences when Seth and his energy does show up. Sure. What's the point of all this, you ask? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> Blessed ancestor Howard Thurman sums it up by saying there is something in every one of us that waits and listens for the sound of the genuine inside yourself. It is the only true guide you'll ever have. It's the only true guide you'll ever have. And if you cannot hear it, you will, you will all of your life spend your days on the ends of strings that somebody else pulls. Until you get it together and hear that inner voice, that that God self that's telling you, guiding you, directing you, telling you what to listen to. That something told me that so often we ignore. Now I'm talking about me right now. I'm sure nobody else does this. <laughs> that something tells me that we all ignore from time to time. And after the, the thing is passed, we say, Dad, Nabbit, something told me I should have. Something told me I should have. Anger and our recovery from the experience of anger teaches us how to respond, mm -hmm. how to stand in our power, mm -hmm. sometimes how to recover from having made a mistake. Some of us are perfectionists. We make mistakes and it feels bad. Sometimes we get defensive or resistant or et cetera, et cetera, just because really that reaction is grounded and rooted in our desire to do right and get it. And it's hard for us when we slip up. Yeah. But evaluating our experiences honestly helps us to stand in our power and say, yes, I did make a mistake, but trust and believe I am still here. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep growing, and I'm going to continue to do my best. Yeah. Anger and our recover from, recovery from the experience also teaches us how to turn within and listen and listen and how to be response-able and not response-disabled. What response are we able to bring? In the book of the Declarations of Virtues on page 97, in the Husea, passage number 10, it says, I'll give you a second to turn there. Page 97, passage number 10. And Tef, the high steward of the office of the government, says, I'm silent before the angry. That's the centering down. I am silent before the angry, patient with the ignorant in order to quell conflict. I am cool, 
free from hasty acts, from hasty acts, not from acts, not from action, but from hasty acts, anticipating the outcome, expecting what occurs. That's a sacred insight. Right, that's mastery. I am one who counsels in situations of strife, a person who knows which words incite anger. Okay, so in this passage, we can see that Antep, this is from Antep, Antep Stile, and he's stating that he knows what, in situations of strife, he knows which words incite anger. He knows them not so they can be used as a weapon. It's not about figuring out and thinking and conniving to push somebody's buttons. It's about recognizing which words can be you can incite anger so that he can use them as a tool. He knows what not to say so that he can help maintain balance, right action, and right order. Now this is written on a stele, which we know is a funeral text, funerary text, which was typically placed at the feet of the dead. And it's a statement truly about doing ma'at and being responsible with one's words, especially in the face of difficult situations, um, often ones that can involve anger. So we can see in the stele that the statements are both aspirations and affirmations. The stele is typically written while the person is still alive. So they're saying, these are the values that I believe in, and these are the things that I did. They're making a case for themselves with the Neturu to say, I was a good person when I lived. I did my best. These are all the positive things that I did. Mm -hmm. Again, you ask, what's the point? What's the point? We're working to become our higher selves mm -hmm. so that we can be who the Most High intends us to be in this world and in the universe. Sure. And in the universe, there is a greater experience here. That's the point of learning and growth and development. We are each lifelong students and we need to learn the lessons that we are blessed with regardless of what the professor looks like. I'll show you. And I just want to point out that it's 1236. Good job. Good job. Good job. Open invitation to join us here for the day. Um, we're going to uh, hear from Minister Makalisi, uh -huh. um, who will be delivering a message next week. All right. And uh, we're looking forward to that. So, of us who will be here. And um, before I ask our community announcements, um, we're going forward today. Um, I'm going to be traveling for work over the next three weeks. So, I know y'all surprised. Shy. 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 Right. Shy. 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 Never happy. Shy. Never happy. And I uh, just want to ask you for a traveling break. I'm going to be in let's see, Birmingham, Monterey, back here with Brother Village Network, Baltimore, uh, New Orleans, and Pine Bluff. Over the next three weeks. Over the next three weeks. So um, I'll have a change of clothes <laughs> at the airport, um, but I won't be around. But everywhere I go, I take you with me. Because everything I've learned over the years of uh, being a part of this community, people are hungry for it. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. You know, wherever we go, people are hungry for uh, this knowledge and wisdom and uh, how to be African um, in very practical ways. And so a lot of the work, for instance, work I'm doing in uh, D.C. tomorrow, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, working with a brother named Jerry Kayo, who is working with some folks in Montgomery County, uh, social services, who are doing healing work um, with young people in the community. And they have a Latino perspective on mm -hmm. cultural medicine point of view, and they asked me to come and talk about activism. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're doing very practical work around libation, around mm -hmm. um, what kind of things do our children need to know to, to create their identity. Um, so anyway, uh, just keep me in prayer as I move around, um, as we are a grand network of healers. Yeah. So that's basically what we are. Um, and then you'll be doing your work here and other places where I'm doing work there, and it's all one. Um, and now for this week, any events that are coming up this week that we need to be aware of? Um, we have the Ramadan that's already been taking 
comfort even over there in Santa Rosa. We have two ladies here that will be looking for presents for their car. Yes. So um, open up your purses, your hearts, and um, wallets. And wallets, absolutely. Um, the bowl was out of the first <laughs> Oh, that's right. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I mean, I mean, wait a minute. Both these, like, these two you know. trophy winners over here. Um, but it's going to be a lot of fun. And um, uh, we're looking forward to your support. And district, can we give money in advance to the kids? So that yeah. We can yeah. Please, please okay. give money in advance. Okay. Because yeah. that two-step was always yeah. quite uh, And it's a whole anniversary weekend. That's so. Good. Friday starts with a dance class for like-minded community, so the Santosa community folks from Santa Fe and the Sarset Society and then the Karak community folks from uh, LA are coming up and we're going to have a dance class for our session. The long story short, it's going to be held here. It'll be held here. And, um, and it'll be a full weekend of activity. So we plan to attend and participate and celebrate and bring And we'll start the first that will start September. Oh yeah. Fifth. Fifth. Starting to promote it now. We'll be getting email out around yep. it mm -hmm. all that early, early. Yeah. and tell people that you know. Yeah. I, I, I'll be doing an online class with a group uh, called Holy uh, Holy and Tour uh, that starts November 4th. Wow. And uh, uh, the class I'll be doing is called Kwanzaa and Guga Saba Foundation mm -hmm. for African Liberation and Restoration. I think you know a little something. <laughs> uh, like it starts November 4th, it'll be online and uh, 8 p.m. Eastern time, 5 o'clock here. I'll still be here for the first session, so uh, anyway, that's that. Okay. You make sure you get the link so people know how to, and we can share that with everybody. I'll be at Houston Love and come up here November 13th.